Hello everyone. I welcome you all to the Tiny ML talk. So today's topic is multi-arm banded on system on the chip, co-frequentis or Bayesian. We have Professor Sumit J. Darak, Associate Professor, Triple IT Delhi, with us today. We want to thank our Tiny ML strategic partners, uh, AI Zip, Analog Devices, Arduino, Arm, Brain Chip, Edge Impulse, Green Wave Technology. Groovity, IBM, ImagineMob, Infinon, Inatara, Microsoft, Nota AI, NXP, Polytechnology, Quixo, Qualcomm, Renesas, Snyder Electric, SensiML, Sony, Silicon Labs, ST Microelectronics, Synaptics, and Cintiar. So Tiny ML is a growing committee. We are at Meetup. Uh, we have a family of 14.5K members across 47, in 47 groups across 39 countries. We are also on LinkedIn. You can follow us on LinkedIn. We have 4K member and 11.6K followers. Uh, so we are also we also have a YouTube channel where all the videos would be uploaded, including this video, and uh, so Tiny ML EMEA twenty twenty three is going to happen on June twenty six to twenty eight at Amsterdam. Uh, you can use the link to get yourself registered. Uh, so our today's speaker is Professor Sumit J. Darag. He has received his engineering degree from Pune University, India, and his PhD from NTU, Singapore in 2007 and 2013, respectively. He's an associate professor at IIIT Delhi and an associate consultant at Apexless Technology, Hyderabad, India. Uh, his research in interest includes the the design of efficient synthesizable algorithms for wireless, radar, and artificial intelligence application, and mapping to re reconfigurable and inter intelligent architectures. Uh, thanks, Pragya. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Olga and Prag uh, Pragya, for the invitation and the taking care of the uh, logistic. Uh, uh, as Pragya introduced me, I'm at uh, IIIT Delhi, and uh, uh, we, we have the labs called Algorithms to Architecture at IIIT Delhi. So before we start the uh, technical part of the today's talk, I'll just briefly give you the, uh, uh, the work we do and what are the things we are planning in the next few months uh, so that any one of you, if you are interested, you can join us for those activities. So uh, in the IIIT Delhi, our focus is on developing the uh, efficient uh, synthesizable algorithms for wireless radar AI al algorithms, as well as the mapping them on the uh, hardware platform uh, along with the system level demonstration. For example, here you can see that this is the uh, uh, compressed sensing based uh, wireless spectrum sen uh, sensing uh, application. Uh, using the multiple uh, antenna array system. And we have developed the complete end-to-end -end, uh, system along with the uh, novel algorithms. Uh, this is the joint work uh, with the uh, ST Microelectronics on mapping the algorithms uh, for the direction of arrival uh, uh, estimation. Uh, these are the deep learning based algorithms, but, but uh, these algorithms are implemented on the a microcontroller, so they are uh, uh, sufficiently optimized, uh, compressed before, uh, so that they can be realized on a small memory, uh, which is available on the microcontroller. Similarly, uh, we have the other demos in the mostly in the wireless and the radar domain, and uh, uh, we uh, usually uh, participate in the various design contests uh, as well as the different industry events and the fellowship. We also have the remote hardware access uh, system at IIIT Delhi where students can access over all the hardware uh, remotely without 
needing to come for the uh, uh, physically accessing without needing to physically come to the lab. Uh, in the summer, we are planning uh, two programs uh, for the outside students. Uh, one is the 14 day summer school on the PJ design flow. Uh, basically here we'll be designing the uh, complete video game on the fpj using the verilog uh, based flow and uh, another is the vlsi revisited this is the fourth year uh, we are doing the vlsi revisited we are uh, uh, covering the all the aspects of the vlsi from the analog domain to the digital domain it's an online program similarly all our work and the uh, uh, courses are available on the youtube channel so whatever I'll be presenting today, the corresponding videos are also available on our YouTube channel. So uh, coming back to the today's uh, uh, presentation. So today I have selected uh, slightly uh, a different topic than the, uh, which is uh, uh, co compared to the uh, tiny ML uh, domain, uh, instead of using, instead of focusing on the deep learning, machine learning algorithm, uh, we are focusing on the online machine learning algorithm where you don't need to do any training. You can directly deploy those algorithms on the uh, in the environment and the algorithm tries to learn from themselves. So this kind of algorithms are called as a multi-arm bandit algorithms, online learning algorithms, or they are also part of the reinforcement learning algorithm. So, in the beginning of the today's talk, I'll be discussing about the what is the uh, why we need a edge computing. I hope you guys, most of you, um, might be aware about the edge computing, tiny uh, edge AI, tiny ML. I'll be briefly discussing uh, from my domain perspective. Then I'll be focusing on the hardware software co design, especially for the system on chip uh, hardware platform, what is the importance of the hardware software co-design. And then I'll be discussing for the upcoming application, uh, why we need to go further to design the intelligent and the reconfigurable architecture. Then uh, using the example of the multi-arm bandit algorithms, I'll go through the various uh, architectures which are designed to map this multi-arm bandit algorithms on the system on chip uh, via hardware, software co-design, intelligence, and the reconfigurable architecture. We'll discuss few results and the uh, multiple interesting open research problems in this domain. Uh, I would like to thank my student uh, who was the BTEC student and he worked as a research intern at uh, IIIT Delhi. And uh, now he's doing the master's in Texas University. So most of this work which I'll be presenting here uh, is done by uh, him. Uh, the all the handouts, all the architecture design source codes of the hardware are available on our GitHub page. Uh, he has also prepared a detailed video about the work. Uh, if you want to know the technical aspects, uh, detail algorithm design, the videos are available. And the work is published in the multiple uh, uh, conferences as well as the IEEE transactions, which are highlighted here. Uh, these are available on our website. So uh, let's get started. So as we know that the, there is an exponential increase in the cloud computing market in the last few years. And uh, you can see that the one of the reason that a lot of us are using a multiple IoT devices. Uh, those IoT devices are, so are, are considered as a smart devices, but in the end these current uh, IoT devices are usually the, they are capturing the data and then the entire data processing is happening in the cloud, that is the data center. But as we know that the cloud resources are limited, uh, so that means we need to have the large number of the data centers and also they need to be distributed all over the world for the latency and the reliability constraint. But in addition to the uh, limited cloud resources, uh, there are also the security concerns. Uh, our data, which is being captured by these uh, cheap IoT devices, are might be uh, susceptible to the uh, cyber attacks, or they might be uh, those data might be used for the some other uh, purposes. So you will see that the multiple news reports, multiple uh, publication highlighting the uh, issues with the data which is being captured by these IoT devices. Then 
uh, the number of IoT devices are still exponentially growing. Uh, after COVID, we have seen that the work from home culture, that means um, majority of the time we are uh, sitting working from home, that has also led to the significant improvement in the data which is communicated over the network. And you will see that the, in the industry 4.0, uh, we are going to have the multiple uh, uh, industry, multiple uh, machines which are connected to the clouds, which will also lead to the further increase in the data which is being communicated over the network. Other than privacy, uh, when, whenever the data is transferred outside your network, obviously it will be susceptible to the cyber attacks and we always want our data to be close to our network or with, within the protected boundary. We also know that the most of these data centers are not green. They are heavily, uh, the electricity consumption is huge because you need to make sure that the, all the servers are uh, maintained below certain uh, temperatures. And to address these uh, challenges, we know uh, the edge computing is a one alternative. There are other alternatives, but the edge computing is the alternative where instead of sending all the data to the clouds, you can have the uh, distributed uh, 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 computing, you can have the some of the computing at the sensor level, some of the uh, computing at the, some of the computing at the uh, access point levels, and so on. So that's where the edge computing, edge AI, tiny ML is gaining its um, attention. In the wireless domain, where I am coming from, a um, lot of industry as well as uh, academia are exploring how the AI ML algorithms can be used in the improve the performance of the wireless algorithm. But the, you, you see the peculiar nature of the wireless networks, most of the algorithms or most of the deployment happens on the hardware which are remotely deployed. For example, in the access point in the base station, most of these algorithms need to be deployed on the hardware. You can't have these algorithms at the cloud compared to some of the other vision algorithm. And you will see that the, there are a lot of talk about using the uh, deep learning, uh, uh, different kind of a deep learning ML algorithms at the physical layer of the wireless uh, uh, nature, wireless algorithm. And the timings are also quite strict, like uh, industry is expecting by 2027, they will come up with the standards to deploy this AI ML algorithms on the hardware. This means that we need to study the existing statistical algorithms. We need to see that whether we should replace the statistical algorithms with the AI ML algorithms, or we need to augment the AI ML algorithms with the uh, statistical algorithms. And then we need to come up with the efficient architecture. And this efficient architecture is especially needed for the wireless application because these are going to be deployed on the hardware, uh, like microcontroller, microprocessor, or the FPGA ASIC other than at the clouds. Similarly, in the other domain, uh, ADAS, uh, vision, satellite, many times you need to deploy these algorithms at the edge um, uh, platform. And that's why mapping these algorithms on the hardware is, a, uh, is gaining popularity. So let's look at what are the edge platforms. We all know that there are uh, different microcontrollers, different FPGAs and the different ASIC platforms are there. But the, now the things are getting slightly more uh, evolved. Uh, now people are moving from the system on board to the system on chip. So in the system on chip, instead of having the separate chips for every functionality and integrating them on the common hardware platform, you have a single chip where entire functionality is embedded. For example, here I'm uh, uh, showing you the example of the Bluetooth uh, system on chip where on a single chip, you have the ARM processor for taking care of the entire uh, control task, along with the, you have the IO um, uh, peripherals and the Bluetooth physical layer. So instead of having the two different chips, say one for the processing and one for the Bluetooth, you have everything integrated on a single chip. And you can see that in the last 10 years, we have seen the significant evolution in our headphones uh, from those bulky large headphones, now we have uh, reached to the ear uh, uh, ports, which are significantly smaller in size. So the system on chip in the last decade has significantly helped us to have the 
large functionality or complex functionality on a single chip. It has helped us to get the very good performance. At the same uh, time, the cost and the power consumption has been significantly low over the last few years. So the advantage, other advantage of the system on chip is the lighter footprint, because instead of having the multiple chips, you have the single chip, so that you have the lighter footprint. You don't need to send the signal outside the chip, so that means you have the good performance, low power consumptions. Uh, reliability is uh, good because your signals are not traveling outside the chip, they are present inside the chip, so you have the good reliability and the cost is less because you need to fabricate fewer number of chips. But now for the next generation application, uh, current system on chip are not uh, sufficient. For example, why? Because existing system on chips are the ASIC based system on chip, that means they are application specific. So in case you want to change the application or you want to upgrade the application, you need to fabricate the new chip. So that, that limits the flexibility of the uh, product. Also, whenever you have the multiple units on a single system on chip, the design complexity is significantly higher. That means you need to have the manpower which is trained on those uh, 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 man managing the complex chip. At the same time, the expectation from the consumers are also changing. For example, till now or till last few years, we were okay with the uh, product with the lower cost and the higher battery, uh, uh, higher battery duration. That and uh, we, we we wanted to have the as much functionality as possible on a single chip. But now, con consumers are uh, uh, expecting the flexible product. For example, we don't want to change the product when we go from one technology to another technology. So if you take example of the mobile, we are whenever we go from the 3G to 4G or 4G to 5G, we have to upgrade our mobile phone. We need to replace our mobile. Phone. So the consumers are expecting that we want a flexible hardware which can be easily upgradable to your future technology. Similarly, the hardware platforms need to be scalable. Scalable, this is the requirement coming from the VLSI engineers or hardware engineers. For example, if you are working on the different uh, products, say uh, low end products and high end products, you don't want to use the different types of hardware platform for the different uh, range of the product. You want to use the same hardware platform with the different features. For example, you might want to use the single core processor for the low end product and a quad core processor for the high end product. So you want a scalable, scalable platforms such that your architecture remains the fix, only the number of features or the resources are increasing as you go from the low end product to the high end product. So these are the expectations uh, are from the hardware engineers and the future uh, consumers and the VLSI industry is looking to develop the hardware platform which can meet this expectation. And a lot of uh, things has happened in the last uh, few years. Uh, we have moved from the single processor based system or processor and the co-processor based system with the processor augmented with the GPU on a single chip. And then you can use the ASIC or the FPJ as a two chip solution to accelerate your task. Then you have seen uh, in the uh, one decade back, uh, single system on chip where you have the ASIC, FPJ and the processor integrated together. For example, this is the uh, power PC from the IBM. You have uh, along with the FPJ or ASIC on a single chip. Then you have this Zinc SOC from the Xilinx where you have the uh, dual core ARM processor and the FPJ on a single chip. See, this can be extended to the quad core processor with the FPJ as well as the GPU and the real time processor on the single, single chip. So you can see that the instead of using the separate chips for every kind of uh, architecture, everything is being integrated on a single chip. Similar to the Xilinx, uh, you have from the Intel, NVIDIA, ST Microelectronics, you have the different uh, system on chip boards, which are coming with the different combination of the processor, GPU, AI accelerator, and the FPGA. 
along with this you have for the application based uh, application specific uh, requirement for example you have this rfsc board where along with this uh, fpga processor you have the adc dac on a single chip along with the accelerator for the uh, channel coders so these are called as a heterogeneous all programmable system on chip and you can see that to implement these algorithms on the on such soc you need to make you need to have the very good hold on your algorithm you need to understand which part of the algorithm can be implemented on the processor fpga asic and um, uh, gpu so similarly in the future you you may see that uh, you will have along with the uh, fpga you may have the small asic augmented with the system on chip because with the asic you get the very high performance and also by using the memory based um, uh, reconfiguration you can get the flexibility so to to map your algorithm on such platform you need to do the hardware software code design hardware software code design means now you have a single chip where you have the processor you have the different types of processor simd processor uh, real time processor you may have the gpu you may have the fpga so you need to decide which part of the algorithms uh, to be implemented on each part of your system this this is complete uh, significantly different from the conventional asic and fpga design flow which is given on the slide in the fpga and uh, asic design flow you have the given algorithm you completely write the rtl code and you implemented that entire algorithms on the fpga and asic but with the this system on chips which are coming into the market now you need to do the hardware software code design where you need to have understand the different parts of the system you need to understand your cost requirement latency requirement power requirement and then you need to decide which part of the algorithm will be go, uh, will be implemented on the uh, software that is your processor which part of the algorithms will be implemented on the hardware which can be fpga and asic and then you need to develop the corresponding files for the corresponding algorithms for the software implementation corresponding algorithms for the hardware implementation generate the hardware file and integrate them together on a single chip so that's what we call it as a hardware software code design for example this is the illustrative example here you can see that the, there is algorithm which where you have the seven different task f1 to f7 they can be of uh, anything you can have the fourier transform you can have the deep learning you have the uh, some uh, convex functions any task are there now the hardware software code design means you need to decide which part of your algorithm goes into the which part of your system chip for example in the top part here you can see that the f1 and f6 tasks are implemented in the processor because they can be implemented better in the sequential manner uh, f5 task is implemented in the gpu because it can exploit the instructions of the gpu on the other hand f2 and f3 are realized on the processor maybe it can be in, uh, implemented efficiently on the fpj and f4 and f7 are the fixed task we don't need any reconfigurability so they are implemented on the asic in the future suppose you want to reduce your cost requirement because fpgas are expensive you can move the most of the task in your asic and keep the fewer number of task in the fpga which is your pl here and you can reduce the size of the fpga as well as cost of the fpga so this is all is covered in the hardware software code design but now for the next generation of application you can't be just limited to the hardware software code design because you will see that the the to meet the flexibility requirement you need a reconfigurable hardware software code design what do you mean by reconfigurable hardware software code design for example here i have the algorithm which has the f1 f2 f3 total six different function and now here i have the case where in the f2 type of the uh, algorithm where it's a, some part of the functionality i am not sure whether this f2 is the so for example if you take the some algorithm in the vision processing i may have a algorithm 1 in the when the illumination is good and i may have the algorithm 2 when the illumination is uh, poor so in that case depending upon the outside illumination i may have to i may want to switch between the algorithm if you use the asic based functionality in that case you might have to implement both the algorithms in parallel but here if you use the fpga functionality 
you can use the same hardware using the dynamic partial reconfiguration. You can use the same hardware and you can switch that hardware between the F21 and F22. So by using the same hardware, by using the same uh, piece of hardware, you can implement, you can switch between your algorithms in the real time. And this is the this is why the FPGAs are getting popular. The full form of the FPGA is the field programmable gate array. They can be reconfigured uh, durable in the field. So by using the reconfigurable hardware software co-design, your decision about which part of the algorithm to be implemented in the FPJ is governed is also governed by the whether that part of the algorithm is reconfigurable, whether you need a reconfigurable feature or not. So if you need a reconfigurable feature, you can move that part into the FPJ. The advantage is that you will be able to use the smaller hardware to implement the multiple algorithms. That means FPJ size will be reduced, hardware size will be reduced, cost will be re reduced. Along with the cost, you also get the future upgradability. For example, suppose that you right now you have designed the algorithm for uh, higher illumination and the lower illumination. But in the future, your customer says that now I want uh, three different uh, types of algorithm for the higher illumination, me medium level illumination, and the low level illumination. You don't need to recall your product. You just need to send the additional hardware file for the your uh, part of the FPGA because FPGA is the field reconfigurable so that you can upgrade your product in the without needing to rec uh, recalling without the need of recalling your product back. So that's we call it as a reconfigurable hardware software co-design. Obviously, if you want to do the reconfigurable or adaptive uh, hardware software co-design, just having the FPGA which is capable of reconfigurable uh, reconfigurability is not sufficient. Why? Suppose you have the algorithm which can switch between the three tasks. Uh, uh, so for example, in the F2, you can have the four tasks, F21, F22, F23, and F24. So you can switch between the four tasks. But who will decide which uh, algorithms to use at a particular time? For example, who will learn from the environment that at a particular time, I want to configure the F2 with the F22. Or at some time later, I want to configure the F2 with the F23. And that's where the intelligent reconfigurable hardware software co-design comes. In the intelligence reconfigurable soft hardware software co-design, you will need an intelligence in your system, which will learn from your environment. For example, in the vision application, you will learn the illumination level. And based upon that, you will select which part of the algorithms I need to configure. In the wireless communication, you will learn from your RF environment, depending upon say noise level, or whether you are indoor or whether you are outdoor, you will decide which algorithms to be used. So this is called as a intelligent reconfigurable hardware software design. So for any algorithms to be implemented in the for any algorithms to be implemented in the system on chip, which is the heterogeneous system on chip, you need to do the hardware software co-design. You need to make sure that you exploit the reconfigurable features and you develop the intelligence so that you can uh, adapt your har hardware in the real time. Now, how to design such hardware software, intelligent reconfigured hardware software co-design? So we can consider the example of deep learning, we can consider the example of the wireless physical layer, or we can, cons we can consider any other examples. For any algorithm, for any system, you, we can explore the intelligent reconfigurable hardware software for design. Uh, for the today's task, what I have done is that I have considered the one algorithm called as a multi-arm bandit algorithms. This multi-arm bandit is again an online machine learning algorithms. And using this uh, multi-arm bandit algorithms, I'll explain you how we can do the hardware software design, how we can optimize the architecture, and what are the significant improvement in the performance we can achieve using the reconfigurable architecture. So before going into the architecture part of the multi-arm bandit algorithm, let's look at the what are these multi-arm bandit algorithms and how they are designed. So as I told you, the multi-arm bandit algorithms is a, one of the, uh, are the part of the online learning algorithm. 
uh, compared to the conventional machine learning and the deep learning algorithms where you need a training and then you deploy the algorithms in the real environment here you don't need any training these algorithms are directly deployed in the real environment they learn from the environment and then they adapt uh, in the environment these algorithms are popular because they have the good analytical uh, tractability their performance is uh, you can uh, do the rigorous uh, performance analysis and mathematically you prove the upper and lower bound of these algorithms so that's why they are quite popular in the machine learning community so in this multi arm bandit setup what you do is that you have the uh, you have the some set of arms which we uh, and you, you your goal is to select the optimal arm as many times as possible for example suppose you have the in the wireless communication you have the multiple wireless channels or you have the multiple wireless frequency band you need to identify which frequency band should i use so each channel becomes a arm here and then each arm whenever you will transmit over that channel or arm you will get some reward so you will keep on selecting the arms over the time and over the time you will learn about okay what is the average throughput average rate of each arm and hopefully after some time you will identify that okay this is the channel or this is the arm is good and then you will keep on selecting that arm and this is we call it as a exploration exploitation trade off so what happens in the exploration exploitation trade off here you need to explore all the arms sufficient number of times because you don't know which arms are good and then over the time you will learn what is the average throughput or the reward given by each arm and after that you will exploit the optimal arm as many times as possible they are widely used in the different application for example initially they were used in the uh, website advertisement for example in the all the e-commerce website uh, you want to decide which advertise i should put on the uh, web page so that there is a maximum probability that the user will click on that uh, advertise because if you click on that advertise the revenue is generated so on the e-commerce website for every user i need to learn what is the behavior of the user and then i need to among the set of available advertise i need to select a particular ad which will be displayed on the user page so that the probability that the user will click on that ad will increase so they are widely used in the website advertisement they are also used in the e-commerce website to uh, give you the possible list of the products you may buy particular user may buy so the corresponding product, products gets displayed based upon your past history similarly in wireless networks uh, for the channel selections in cognitive radio this bandit algorithms are being used in the millimeter wave beam forming to select which beam uh, which antenna to use the multi arm bandit are algorithms are used nowadays even in the neural networks this multi arm bandit are used for example uh, in the neural networks you have the multiple layers which are being deployed and you can see that as the number of layers increases your latency increases but in some uh, cases for some particular data uh, data set you don't need to go till the last layer you can exit early you can after second or third layer you can directly get your output so in the by using the multi arm bandit for a given data set you can decide that instead of using all the layers instead of uh, passing your data through all the layers of the neural network you can exit early so that you can get the um, lower latency uh, without compromising on the performance so recently there are couple of papers on how multi arm bandit can be used for the early exit in the neural networks in the healthcare for deciding which drug to be used these algorithms are widely used now how to develop these algorithms so the simple strategy is that obviously i'll always select the top arm but the problem is i don't know which arm is good because arm statistics are known unknown to me so i don't know which arm to use so for that i need to develop some algorithms which will be which through which i'll be able to learn the arm statistics and then once i learn the arm statistics i'll be able to select the optimal arm as often as possible so professor sandeep we have a question yeah. uh, what evaluation matrix do we use for map algorithm for selecting the best one 
Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm coming on that uh, on this slide. You will get the answer about the, which is the performance. Type. So I need to develop the algorithm which will follow a particular policy. And that policy will learn from my previous arm, previous rewards, and then select the arm in the particular time slot. Obviously, we assume that each arm is stochastic with the particular distribution and the mean reward. And obviously, I need to select the arm which gives the as much high reward as possible. Uh, in the usually reward, all the arms are assumed to be independent. So the rewards generated by the arms are IID across times and the between the arms. So what is the performance matrix is the regret. Why regret? For example, if I know which arm is the best one, obviously I will select the, that arm all the time. For example, if you see here, I'm going to select this, the top, the arm with the maximum reward. Mu is the average reward. The arm which has the maximum reward, I'll select it all the time. If my, I have the T time slot, I'm going to select it all the time. But since I don't know the which is the optimal arm, I need to explore certain number of times. So that means for certain time duration, I'm not going to select the optimum arm. And then my regret is the difference between the statistics of those arm, which I have selected and the statistics of the arm, which is the optimal arm. So I need to design the algorithms, which offers the as low regret of the as possible. So whenever I develop the arm, I need to make sure that my regret is as less as possible. And this is the performance matrix, which is widely used in the multi arm bandit algorithm. So you can develop the algorithm, which can select each arm with the equal probability. Obviously, you know that the, you are doing a lot of exploration and this is not optimal arm because you are selecting the each arm with the same probability. Second thing is that you will try to exploit the best arm, best arm as early as possible. But what is the problem? It may happen that since the arms uh, are statistically generating the reward, it may happen that the particular arm, arm, which is not an optimal arm, may select the, may give the good reward in the beginning. And then if you don't do the sufficient exploration, you may stuck on that arm, which is not an optimal arm. So you can't just directly start exploiting the best arm. So, one third policy is that you can do the exploration for certain time in the beginning and then you can exploit. So these are the simple policy we can come up. And if you see on the right hand side, I have shown one example. So here you can see that I have the five arms and you can see that I have the corresponding statistics. And from looking at the statistics, you know that the this arm is the best one, which is has the reward average reward of 0.8 because I want a reward as high as possible. So my optimal policy is that to select this arm as often as possible. So that's why you can see that over the uh, time of around 10,000, I get the average reward of 8,000 because the average probability is 0.8. But I don't know which arm is good. That means I need to do the exploitation. If I start early exploitation, I may go, get stuck at the bad arm. For example, here I got stuck at the mu3 instead of mu, uh, mu uh, four, and you can see that the I got a poor uh, reward or the poor regret. I can do some exploration, and depending upon how much exploration I can do in the beginning, I get the different rewards. So the problem is, I don't know how much to explore because I don't know the statistics. If I do too much exploration, my performance gets affected. If, if I do less exploration, there is a risk that I'll be stuck to the bad arm. So how to find this optimal epsilon so that I can do the perfect, I can do the uh, uh, theoretically uh, minimum exploration and maximum exploitation. But again, it's a trade-off. So in the literature, uh, they have, there are proof that which says that you can, cannot have the regret below this value. For example, this is in the 1985, this uh, theorem says that your regret of your algorithm, whatever the algorithm you design, your regret is inversely proportional to the difference between the mu, that is the average reward of the optimal arm and the average reward of your arm. So if the optimal arm and the, your, the arm which you have selected are very close to each other, 
that means it will take a large amount of time to differentiate between the two arms. That means in that case, the learning problem is a difficult problem. So in that case, your regret will be higher. So this regret definition is the depending upon the statistics of the arm. So there is another regret definition which says that your minimum regret for any algorithm you design is at least this one. So you can see that there are two terms. One is the T, that is the number of time slots for which you run the algorithm. And the second is the K, that is the number of arms. Why it is proportional to the number of arms? Because the more the number of arms, that means more the exploration you need to do. So that means your regret will be increased. So this theorem says that whatever you design the algorithms, your regret cannot be below this one. Okay, so that's what they say the lower bound on the algorithm is this one. So in the literature, there are different algorithms which has been designed and they try to achieve the regret as low as possible. Okay, but the lower bound is this one. One popular way of designing such algorithm is the optimism in the face of uncertainty. So as you sample the particular arm more number of times, your confidence about the what is the average mean of the man, average mean of the arm increases. For example, you, you, if you are sampling the arms 10 times, obviously your variance will be higher. But as you sample the particular arm, arms 100 times, you will get 100 observation of that arm. And that means your confidence about that arm will increase. So what we do in this um, uh, algorithm, for every algorithm, we find out its upper confidence bound and the lower confidence bound. What do you mean by upper and lower confidence bound? Whenever I select the arm, I get the, what is the reward I get uh, when I select the particular arm. So I'll be selecting the particular arm certain number of times. And based upon that, I'll find out the mean reward and uh, I'll find out the variance. So this variance will help you to give the upper confidence bound and the lower confidence bound. Now, what I'll do is that every time slot, I'll select the arm which has the highest confidence bound because that is my optimism that at the current time slot, based upon my past observation, this arm has the upper confidence bound. That means its expected mean is the highest here. Okay. So the arm which has the highest upper confidence bound, I'll select it. And this is the called as a UCB algorithm. So what UCB algorithm does at every time slot, I'll select the arm which has the highest UCB factor. And how this UCB factor is calculated, it's very simple. So what, what this algorithm is done? In the beginning, obviously I'll select each arm once because I'll get some information about the arm. Then after that, for every time slot, I'll find out the average mean. That is how much, how many times I have selected the arm and the corresponding reward I have got, the ratio of the reward divided by the uh, time, I'll get the uh, corresponding average throughput of that arm. And then this is the factor called as the exploration factor. So what is this exploration factor? You can see that there is a T is at the bottom here. What does it a TI indicate? How many times I have selected this particular arm? If I have not selected the particular arm sufficient number of times, that means I don't have much information about that arm. So this factor will force you to select that arm. If you have selected the particular arm sufficient number of times, that means you have learned or you have observed that arm significantly sufficient number of times, that means this TI will be higher and this term will become smaller and this term will become dominated. So this is how the exploitation and exploration has been managed here. In the beginning, you will explore and hopefully after some time, your second term will become smaller, this term will become dominating and you will select the arm which is has the higher throughput as possible. And this algorithm, you can see that the regret of this algorithm is kt log t. Minimum regret is kt, square root of kt that we have seen in the previous slide. And this performs the kt log t and it is a quite well-known popular algorithm. Similar to the upper confidence bound algorithm, there are other algorithms are also there in the uh, one. So this is another algorithm called as the KLUCB. I won't go into the detail, but if you are interested, you can look at the uh, one. This is the most optimal algorithms available in the 
uh, uh, current literature, but you will see that the, this algorithm is a very complex algorithm because of the optimization problems available here. Now, there is a, another algorithm which is based upon the Bayesian approach, and that's where my talk uh, uh, the title is whether we should select the multi arm bandwidth algorithm based upon the frequency based approach or the Bayesian approach. The algorithm which we have seen UCB or the KLUCB, they are based upon the frequency based approach. What we do, we select those arms certain number of times and we select the arm which has the highest throughput. So the probability that we will select the particular arm is proportional to the average reward we have received in the past. Uh, observation. But there is another way to develop the algorithm, which is called the Bayesian modeling. And this is the Thomson sampling algorithm is based upon the Bayesian modeling. In this one, what this algorithm is does that it assumes that the mean reward of the arm is proportional to the degree of belief that the arm is of, of optimal. So I, for every arm, I'll have the, some belief that, okay, this arm with this probability will be the optimal and then I'll select that arm. So this is the completely different way of developing the algorithm than the UCP algorithm, which we have seen in the previous one. So what we do in the Thomson sampling algorithm, we update our beliefs based upon our past observation using the Bayes rule, which is quite common in the Bayesian one. And by using the prior belief, we find out the what is our posterior belief for a given likelihood. So for more detail of the algorithms, you can look into the literature, but this is gen general uh, idea. But the problem is that since the arm statistics are unknown, so we, there is an uncertainty about the arm optimality. So what we model the arm, uh, what, is the, what, is, what we model is that for every arm, there is a probability of being optimal. And using that probability, we select the arm with the highest probability of being the optimal using the posterior distribution. So in the multi-arm bandage setting, what we do for every time slot, we find out the probability of the arm being optimal. Then we select that arm and then we play that arm and we get the reward of that arm. Using that reward, we find out the posterior belief of that arm and we posterior belief of that arm and we use the same uh, repetitive approach in the rest of the time slot. So that means there is a conjugate prior he is uh, present here because your posterior belief becomes a prior in the subsequent time slot. So you have the conjugate prior between the posterior belief and the prior belief. But the problem is that this conjugate prior are different for div different type of statistics. There are Bernoulli statistics, there are uh, Gaussian statistics, there are Poisson statistics, and for every case, there is a different distributions out there. For example, for Bernoulli, there is a beta distribution for the uh, poison or the exponential statistics, there are different distributions. So what is the challenge in the frequency based uh, approach? You have the single algorithm for all the statistics, but in case of the Bayesian algorithm, you have the different algorithms for the different statistics. So for example, for the Bernoulli statistics, this is the Thomson sampling algorithm. What you do? For every time slot, you find out the uh, posterior belief using this beta distribution function, and then you choose the arm which has the highest probability of being the optimal. Now, what is the problem? Now, if you want to implement these algorithms on the hardware, you need to have the you need to have the hardware architecture for the beta distribution. For example, for in case of the UCB algorithm, you only have the square root log function, which is easy. But in case of the Thomson algorithm, uh, you can see that you have the you need to calculate the beta distribution. So this is the uh, Thomson sampling algorithm. I'll just skip it, but it is the optimal algorithm and it is one of the most popular algorithms available in the uh, uh, currently literature. So if you uh, see so the, we, yeah. so we have one more question. How yeah. much does the prior belief relies on the posterior belief to update? Yeah. So your uh, the posterior belief takes the information about the reward. So reward is the input and based upon the reward and the prior belief, you get update the posterior. So every time slot, you get only one observation and using that one observation, you update the posterior belief. I hope I have addressed this question. So 
So here you can see that in the literature, there are multiple studies which shows that the Thomson sampling algorithm is the most efficient algorithm. You can see from here uh, plot, uh, the in case of the Thomson sampling algorithm, the, the, there are five arms and the, you can see that the middle arm, the arm with the, the third arm with the 0.5 average reward is the optimal arm. And that has been selected highest number of times in the Thomson sampling algorithm. So the Thomson sampling is one of the most popular algorithm. And uh, these are the, you can see that the uh, upper and lower confidence bound and the Thomson sampling performs quite well. So to look at the three algorithms, you can see that the UCP algorithms is easy to imp in implement. It's a distribution independent. Uh, the only disadvantage is that it has that alpha parameter, but you can keep it fixed. So that's not a big challenge. Uh, we'll skip the KLUCP algorithm because it's a hugely complex algorithm and difficult to implement in the hardware, but we have a paper where we have implemented it in the hardware, but we are more interested in the Thomson sampling because Thomson sampling is a very good algorithm. It performs well. Unfortunately, it is the distribution de dependent algorithm. For every distribution, you have the different kind of Thomson sampling algorithm. And because of the beta uh, function, it is very hard to implement the algorithm. So to get the algorithms on uh, multi arm bandings uh, algorithms on the hardware, you need to come up with their efficient architecture. So in the beginning, we started with the UCB algorithm and we implemented the UCB algorithm on the hardware. Again, by using the hardware software co-design, you can see that the, there is a separate uh, UCB calculation for every arm because you need to calculate the UCB factor for every arm. And then you do the sorting and find out the maximum. You can do it in the FPGA or you can do it in the processor by using the hardware software code. So implementing the UCB is not a challenge. Uh, what we also did is that we also developed the reconfigurable version of the UCB. In the literature, there are multiple UCB available in the uh, literature. One here, the algorithm which we discuss, it learns the optimal mean. But there are algorithms which learns the uh, algorithm which has the highest mean, also low variance, because in sometimes you want the arm to be with the arm to be selected with the low variance. Then there is also another algorithm called as the UCB T, which has a slightly better performance than the UCB, but it has a slightly higher complexity as well. So we can see that the corresponding uh, resource utilization and the um, uh, power consumption of these three algorithms are uh, given. So what I would like to highlight is the reconfigurable nature of the uh, FPGA. So if you want to implement all the three algorithms, but at a time you are going to use only one algorithm, then one option is that you implement the Velcro uh, architecture where all the algorithms are implemented in parallel and you will get the significantly high complexity. Another one is that you use the partial reconfiguration capability of the FPGA and develop the reconfigurable architecture where the same part of the hardware can be reconfigured with the UCB or UCB V or UCB T. And you can see that there is a significant reduction in the complexity as well as power consumption by using the reconfigurable hardware and also cost because you can use the smaller FPGA compared to the uh, higher, uh, larger FPGA. In the UCB case, selection of the appropriate UCB algorithm is not a challenging because each algorithm is different. For example, you want a low latency, you can use UCB. If you want a good performance, you can use the UCBT. If you want to select the arm with the high mean and the low variance, you can use the UCBV. So selection, developing the intelligent algorithm, it's not, it's not that challenging. You can have the simple um, uh, selection decision-making um, uh, FSM and you can implement it and you can make your algorithms intelligent and reconfigurable. That means your same hardware can work for the as a UCBV, UCBT and the UCB algorithm depending upon your requirement. But as I told you, why to use the UCB if the Thomson sampling is better? Because we have seen that the UCB Thomson sampling performs much, much better than the UCB. But the problem is that the Thomson sampling is the very distribution dependent. It has the inbuilt beta function, which is difficult to implement on the hardware. So the Bayesian approach based Thomson sampling uh, algorithm has the is the distribution dependent, it has the beta function. So there is no architecture is available which can map the Thompson sampling on the hardware. So 
when we were uh, looking at the how to implement the Thomson sampling on the hardware, uh, we tried to implement the beta function as it is on the hardware, but it was not possible. There were a lot of integration uh, operations were there. It was making uh, things very complex. So then our, what we did is that we came up with the approximate version of the beta distribution on the hardware, because whenever the algorithms is not possible to be mapped on the hardware, you need to come up with the uh, corresponding approximation version. For more details, I'll again uh, uh, refer to this paper, which is available online. But our idea was same. What we were generating, we were generating uh, for every arm, we were generating certain number of random num numbers. And then we were sorting them in the uh, decreasing order. And then depending upon the past observation reward, which is given by this sum, we were selecting that particular random number uh, uh, in the uh, sorted order. So this is what we have implemented the approximation version of the uh, beta distribution. And uh, it was working, the algorithm at the simulation level, it was working quite well. But the problem of this uh, algorithm was we had to use the pseudo random number generators uh, in the hardware. And this pseudo random number generator has their own limitation. For example, you need to, in every time slot, you need to generate a large number of random numbers because for every arm, you can see that you need to generate the TI number of random number generators. Now, also this TI will be increasing over the time. That means the number of random number generators to be increased needs to be increased over the time. That means the time to decide which arm to be selected will be increasing over the time. Then you need to sort those number of random numbers. Sorting is a very difficult operation in the hardware. It takes a lot of time because it's some sequential operations are involved. So it, it takes a lot of time and there is a large number of memory read and the memory write operations. Also, you need to store this random number generator. So you need to uh, you need to store with a sufficient precision. That means huge memory requirement was there. So these are the architectural problems were there uh, in this uh, mapping this Thomson sampling algorithm. So what we did, we came up with the efficient version of the uh, this uh, Thomson sampling algorithm. What we did is that instead of sorting the random numbers using their actual values, we grouped the random numbers into the different beans so that we can, instead of having the real num numbers, we have the only certain num certain precision of the random numbers. Obviously, it led to the loss in the some accuracy, some uh, regret, but still on the hardware, it was much, much faster. So grouping the random numbers also allows us to reduce the word length significantly. And you will see later that by uh, reducing the word length, we got the significant improvement in the performance. Also, by using the smaller uh, number of the uh, smaller precision, our number of comparators were significantly reduced. And we got the significant improvement in the memory as well as the number of memory read write uh, operations. So, what I wanted to highlight is that uh, understanding the algorithmic part of the algorithms will help you to significant, significantly reduce the complexity, uh, come up with the approximated version without compromising on your performance. So if you see here, this is the Thomson sampling algorithm, uh, which was not synthesizable before. Now we were able to synthesize it, synthesize it. And you can compare with the UCB. UCB has a very simple X pi T operation plus square root alpha log N divided by T. So UCB is very simple. In the Thomson sampling, you need to generate random numbers, uh, store them, sort them and then uh, find out the, uh, the corresponding particular random number and compare them. So still you can see that the, we were able to get a much lower complexity in terms of the LUT and the DSP because you don't need to do the arithmetic operations, the number of DSPs were less, but the memory requirement was higher because you need to store those random numbers in the memory, but the power consumption was significantly less because of this one, because of the uh, uh, lower number of DSP. Again, we had the architecture which can now switch between the Thomson sampling and the UCB algorithms in the real time. And because of the reconfigurable architecture, we got the significant improvement in performance. Now you can see that in the SOC, you can implement the algorithms on the FPGA. You can implement the algorithms only on the processor and you can implement the algorithms on the processor plus co-processor. And here you can see that the, obviously by implementing the algorithms on the FPGA, you get the significant speed up. Your execution time 
here is uh, much smaller this is the execution time in the microsecond it is much smaller but if you move to the processor it's a sequential one it is higher and by using the coprocessor you can see that you get the significant reduction in the execution time but you can notice that the reduction is different for the different type of algorithm the reduction is not significant for the ucb algorithm because of the arithmetic operation involved but it is significant for the thomson sampling operation because of the memory operations are there so depending upon the algorithm you need to decide whether to implement the algorithm in soc processor or use the coprocessor another interesting thing you can see that if you move to the fixed point architecture from the floating point in case of the thomson sampling you got the significant reduction in the every aspects of the uh, resource utilization and even the power consumption so now you can see that the thomson sampling is significantly better than the ucb when you go to the fixed point and obviously you should select the word length which uh, lead to the uh, minimum degradation in the performance that's why hardware software co design fixed point optimization is critical because it will help you to get the same performance as the floating point but with a significantly lower resources and also the type of the algorithm type of the arithmetic you do uh, the corresponding gains will be different so the so pragya i'll just finish in two minutes i hope that is fine yes. so now we have the thomson sampling algorithm we have the uh, ucb algorithm but as i told you in the beginning ucb algorithm is the distribution dependent a distribution independent that ucb algorithm can work if your arm statistics are um, uh, gaussian bernoulli exponential or any type on the other hand thomson sampling algorithm which we have designed works only for the bernoulli distribution what happens when the thomson sampling when your distribution is not the bernoulli algorithm you need to use the different thomson sampling algorithm but that architecture is not available so right now we have the thomson sampling algorithm only for the bernoulli distribution and we have the ucb algorithm for the any distribution the advantage of the thomson sampling it works better than the ucb and it has the lower complexity than the ucb so in real application arm statistics may not be fixed to a single distribution that means you you need to make sure that you can use the ucb algorithm which will work for all the arm statistics but it will perform poorer than the thomson sampling thomson sampling algorithm works for the give, uh, current thomson sampling algorithm which we have works well for the bernoulli but it doesn't work well for the other distribution so that means we need to select the right algorithm for the right distribution which is not known to us that means we need to learn which distribution is there in the environment and based upon that we need to select switch between the thomson sampling and the ucb algorithm so can we design the intelligent architecture that can switch between the ucb and thomson sampling what is the challenge you need to learn the distribution because you don't know the distribution and then you need to find out whether to use the ucb and whether to use the thomson sampling so uh, recently we have proposed this idea where we have added the exploration exploration trade off on the algorithm itself so we switch between the ucb and ts in the beginning and hopefully down the line we switch we focus on the one particular algorithm and we refer to as the intelligent reconfigurable multi arm bandwidth algorithm so if you see here on the top you can see that the regret plot and you can see that the thoms uh, this is the ucb algorithm and you can see that this is the thomson sampling algorithm and this is for the bernoulli distribution all the experiment there are 20 experiment and the average is done over the 20 as experiment and all the distribution you can see that the thomson sampling performs better than this and that's why we say that the thomson sampling is empirically very good al algorithms because it when for a bernoulli distribution this thomson sampling which al will always outperform the ucb algorithm but when the distribution is random so you can see that here our distribution is randomly selected now you can see that the thomson sampling is performing very poorly compared to the ucb because thomson sampling is designed only for bernoulli but since the distribution is random it can have bernoulli it can anything thomson sampling perform poorly and this ucb perform better now what we have done we have designed this rimab algorithm which learns the distribution 
details are available in the paper and then it will appropriately switch between the ucb and the thomson sampling algorithm and you can see here the bottom figures these are the experiment there are total 100 experiment and in each experiment if you can see that there are certain peaks here of the black colored peaks so this is a uh, regret of the thomson sampling algorithm so if the, these are peaks are there that indicate that for those time slot or for those experiment thomson sampling is not a good choice so what our algorithm does our algorithm selects the ucb add for those experiment where the thomson sampling is not good or it may not perform good or you can say that the distribution is non bernoulli and for bernoulli distribution our algorithm will switch to the ucb algorithm so by using this reconfigurable architecture we are able to switch between the ucb and thomson sampling and we are able to get the best of the both the performance uh, here this is my last uh, slide here you can see that the thomson sampling algorithm has a very large variance across the regret that means it the uh, on an average the regret is the variance is very large on the other hand you can see that the rim algorithm the um, uh, regret is also uh, uh, the variance is significantly lower uh, what we have done we have also shown the application of this uh, mab algorithm in the wireless we have designed the transmitter physical layer receiver physical layer and the parameters are designed using the corresponding multi amp bandwidth algorithm so multi amp bandwidth algorithm decides which wireless channel to choose for a given transmitter and receiver and we have shown that it performs better so to conclude uh, for any algorithms to architecture mapping on the soc you need to do the efficient hardware software co design and word length analysis for the upcoming application just a hardware software co design and the word length analysis is not sufficient you need to design the intelligent reconfigurable architecture mab is a popular algorithms there are many algorithms multi amp bandwidth algorithm for which the ar architecture does not exist and coming up with the efficient architecture for the mab algorithm is one of the uh, open uh, problems uh, people can take up uh, what happens when the your statistics are changing over time for this stationary scenario or when the number of arms are large in number because you need to find out the quality factor for every arm so when the number of arms are large in size how to come up with the efficient architecture these are the open challenges in this part. so uh, with this i would like to conclude yeah uh, thank you professor samrat yeah and thank you all the audience for staying with us so we want to thank our strategic partners our executive strategic partners edge impulse Qualcomm AI Research, Cynthia, Platinum Strategic Partners, Renesas, uh, Atrios, Gold Strategic Partners, Analog Devices, Arduino Pro, um, AI, Infineon, Inatera, Microsoft, Sensi ML, ST Microelectronics, Synaptics, and our silver strategic partners. So we want to thank you all for joining us for the talk. The talk will be uploaded on YouTube. Thank you very much for the summit.